Okay, capitalism is all about conforming to the status quo and money sticks the money. And if you want to get rich, you have to either play the financial game or you have to figure out how to manipulate people to sell them something they don't need, right? So you have to study those shadows on the wall of the cave very carefully so that then you can change the shadows to your benefit. But you never turn around and say, what the hell? Where is this country going? Where is my soul going? Where are my relationships going? Down the toilet, incidentally. <laughs> okay, do you understand that, guys? So are you looking at the cave analogy as, okay, so the freed mind, the freed slave is looking back at the ones who are still in prison and trying to figure out how to take advantage of them because he knows? No, no. okay. Okay, so no, the prisoners are staring at the shadows. Right. The shadows are people by nature seek pleasure, wealth, glory and power so i score high on the sats i'm gonna win i can even get more pleasure more wealth more glory and more power and i just have to study those shadows better and figure out how to throw my wrench in there and get people to head in the direction of buying this product rather than that product or um, does that make sense yeah does that make sense to you, Ivy? Or Warren, that our society rewards people who fine tune the shadows. Yeah. And because our society is based on the view that greed is good, it's a virtue because it gets you to work hard. Work hard at what? Right? And the SATs are all designed for that. And I'm telling you, even if you want to have a lot of status in the profession of philosophy, that's what you have to be good at. Seeing what the other people, the people who are famous are doing and imitating them. And if you happen to go to a good graduate school, you had an advisor who's already made himself famous and you become his little disciple. Mm -hmm. But it has nothing to do with Plato. Whereas Mr. Hedges does, he gets it. But I have to confess, right? He's, he was a Presbyterian preacher's kid. His dad was against the war, civil rights. I'm a Methodist preacher's kid. My dad marched with in Selma. He was against the Vietnam War, he's gay. There's a really a type there that unites reason and faith. And they like Plato, right? <laughs> But this is the kind of Plato that Plato wanted for you to get that eye of your soul and look down at your city and say, hey, stop, you know, <laughs> go this way. And so Mr. Hedges is like Plato, I think, where the dialogue, Socrates goes and talks to the businessmen, he talks to the political leaders, he talks to these people. So Hedges has a different chapter where he's talking to and he literally interviews, right? the porn stars, the worldwide wrestling, the, um, the academics, and the, um, what the, the psychologists that sell out to happiness studies. So he's doing what Socrates did, and he knows it. And when we read, we're going to read the whole chapter on the academy later on, because my class is about education and psychology, right? How how you want your psyche to work. What's a healthy psyche means what kind of education do you want, right? And so what is a healthy psyche? Is it one that, that pursues pleasure, wealth, power, and glory? Or is it one that pursues rule for the sake of the rules, uh, truth, justice, and wisdom, right? And you have to you know, ponder that because it doesn't mean you're going to be popular or famous, but I don't think any of you are going to be given the death penalty either. So, you know, I mean, we might laugh about it, but it wasn't very funny. It's not funny if you live in Russia right now, 
uh, right? And it, it's still not funny when you live in a lot of places in this world. Um, so Warren, do you have a comment? Did you have a comment on the reading? Not, not right now, because I didn't, I didn't get to, I realized you posted it last night and I just saw it this morning, so. You need to, to email me, it. Warren. You can't, like, if you're looking for it earlier, email me. Um, okay. Okay, because I just, I understand it was late, but nobody emailed me, so I had to assume the students weren't looking for it, so I lucked out, you know. But if you had, if as soon as you wanted it, I'm online a lot, so. No problem. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I am sorry, but I. No, it's not. A, it's not a you. It's not. It's not. We're blaming okay. you or anything. It's, it just happens. It happens because it's not like. Okay. I think this is the only time it's ever happened before. So. Okay. It's okay. Not... And then the next thing is that, of course, I like your insights. Right. You're part of the group. Yes. So, of course. <laughs> okay. Now, anybody want to have any or reaction before I start talking about this? Um, let's go back to get the the gist of the class, how it, how the pieces fit together. So we had the ancient view, Aristotle, and then we had the moderns, and they split up into the the dualists, Kant and Descartes, where you detach yourself. And then the other side was the empiricists. And you had, I wanna start with Mill, remember? And you had maximizing pleasure, minimizing pain, the higher pleasures. And Bentham said, there's no higher pleasures, right? It's just push pin is as good as poetry for your leisure time activity, right? So, that's where we get happiness. And that's why we have that happiness studies is huge these days. Oh my God. I mean, we keep reinventing the wheel at this point, but all right. So we had the two branches of the enlightenment and then William James, the epitome, the will to believe, so he went from Bentham, you know, I mean, Mills says basically the essence of religion is empathy, you know, and so following that, William James could say, yeah, you have a right to have faith, but he just assumed it would have this empathy and it would be a higher pleasure and people who had it would all agree on how to construct a society where people are self-controlled and generous. Uh, you know, no problem, right? No problem. <laughs> Give people the freedom to have a religion, right? America was based on freedom to have faith. And so why not? Uh, you Harvard snobs, you elitists over here that condemn all religion, you shouldn't do that. People have a right to have a religion. America was about that. All right, all right. Everybody got it? Got the mindset? Um, then we had what actually happened. Uh, okay, the rich got richer and the poor got poorer and John Stuart Mill was a bit too utopian because he thought it was a blank slate and we could social engineer this stuff. Uh, Marx also thought it was a blank slate, but that money socially engineered everything. So all of a sudden in the 20th century, there's you know, two world wars. How did this happen? Well, Marx says because of capitalism. And if we just get rid of it, then we're going to have utopia, right? And for him, religion was the opiate of the people. You got to get rid of religion and then you can have a strong and stable middle class. But you'll never have that as long as you have religion. All right. And he would say those Americans are way too optimistic and they think they're exceptional. They think they're different, but I don't think Marx would think he, I mean, he's, I think they would have thought eventually America's gonna fall because of their greed, but you know, that's their problem. Uh, we gotta take care of Europe and we gotta make Europe great, you know, in terms of a middle class. Not great again. We're not looking backward. We're looking forward. 
So this is that history is always moving forward. So, okay. Then we had Benedict with everything is relative, moral relativism. And what I said was actually she values critical thinking. She's not a relativist. She says she's a relativist, but she idealizes these little communities that are internally coherent with themselves. And then she demonizes the USA for trying to interfere with them. And she does it by undermining every common value in the US so that we have no unity and we have no coherence. So obviously she values critical thinking to the point where you know she'll just throw a wrench. Well, the problem is American imperialism, you know, that because we think we better, we're going to try to control them. But you can just say that critical thinking is necessary if you want a free and open society. But that is a moral value. And it, it's not just any old kind of critical thinking. It's for the sake of justice for the sake of forming a strong and stable middle class for the sake of having people have trust and goodwill for each other um critical thinking about bigotry critical thinking about um an unjust economic system critical thinking about you know all the things that you have to think critically about before you're going to come together as a strong and stable middle class and then, yeah, slavery is not, you cannot mold people. They're not a blank slate. Certain things are absolutely fundamental. And no matter how powerful the conditioning is, it will always be wrong. And, and people in it will always get that to the point where enough people get it and they communicate with enough other people that you can get rid of it. Um, all right, then you had Freud's view of God is the big daddy in the sky. And so, so this uh, Marx, that's why Marx wanted to get rid of religion. It's an opiate. Oh, you know, the big daddy, oh, he's got it, you know, he's got this, he'll take care of it. But then um, John Stuart Mill and William James, the freedom to have religion, no problem. And Ruth Benedict would say, what, religion's been used for all these purposes. I mean, it's hard to know because in her communities where she said they're small and insulated, a lot of those people have a religion. That's what keeps them integrated with themselves is religion. <laughs> but she herself, you know, wants to blow up all religion in America. So. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to teach this stuff because the stuff doesn't hang together very well. But anyway, so William James, now we've got hedges. What is actually going on in this country? And so what I want you to think about is how all those strains in thinking that we've, we've brought, you know, that are there in the collective unconscious, in our culture, we have that kind of Puritanism of Augustine and that we have a modern version of that in Kant, you know, just push away all your other emotions, you know, it's the moral law. And then that was used by Hitler. Um, so we have that Puritan strain. We have the humanistic, Aristotelian Thomistic strain of thought and Pope Francis recognizes that. And then we start having the modern dualism and the empiricism. And the empiricism is the most powerful if you take social science. And if you take science and social science, they all use scientific method. And social science takes the method of the sciences and applies it to studying behavior. Well, the humanities has tried to imitate that. And that's, a, that's stupid because the humanities are, should really be educating your mind, which is totally different. It was rejected by the enlightenment. 
So, so Plato teaches you about human affairs. Tragedy teaches you in an entirely different way than, um, than social science. So the image of the cave, again, that's where Alicia said you get it in a psychology class. And um, now I'm not quite sure how to, to map on. I know that when I teach logic, my students bring up that they learn in psychology a lot of that, like confirmation bias, um, the way people don't think logically because of their emotions or their bubble that they live in. Um, but, okay, so Hedge's big thing is that America... Uh, Dr. Beck, yeah. I think the way that they combined it all in the class that I was talking about is, you know, this is just the history of, like history and, history and systems of psychology. Like, it starts with ancient, I mean, we talked about Aristotle and Plato and, um, oh, a couple of others, but anyway, it's, we start out with this one idea, this one thought, and how they all built off of the thoughts that came before them. And so when he talked about uh, the cave and then uh, Francis Bacon's idols and stuff like that, this is just different stems off of the original line of thinking. Okay. So is there an implicit bias that there's progress always being made? No, I mean, he taught that, you know, at the time they thought they were highly progressive, you know. Um, but he also talks about how some of these ideas are, have been completely discredited, like um, how we were made is we were just little disembodied pieces laying around and we just drew like the arms and legs were like drawn together from some connection or something and I mean it, they really thought like that um so he did it, Dr. Miller was the instructor he did a good job of kind of piecing together how obviously in our era it makes absolutely no sense or it makes sense but in that person's time, like when um, Paul and his big theory of adolescence came out at, you know, turn of the century when psychology was just starting to find its footing in America, for them, the theory of evolution and how, um, I'm not going to remember the, the term, but it, it had something to do with children are this way because of natural instinctual drives that have been present since the beginning of evolution. Um, how what they thought made sense at that time, which is what I've had found myself having to do in this class. The person we're talking about this week, they really believed this. You know, this seemed legitimate and real and true to them. Even though to me, I'm looking like, how in the world can you even think this? But for them, it was real. And I think that was, that was more of the line that Dr. Miller took with it. Right. Yeah. But, but at any point in time, any of those people could have seen broader, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. not only that, I think there always were people who thought bigger, but they didn't get famous. The people who got famous are the ones that had the particular bee in their bonnet that happened to be to fit the spirit of the times. So it resonated with enough other people that they got the degrees and the jobs and were able to publish and get their stuff out there. Does that make sense? Yeah, and he touched on that a little bit because like, Paul, even though he was a big deal for psychology, he isn't very well known. Who? Uh, Hall, the guy who wrote the theory of adolescence, G. Stanley Hall. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, 
he was, I mean, groundbreaking for his time, but we don't know very much about him. We don't hear much about him because his contemporaries kind of laughed at him. They're like, oh, oh my goodness. Are you serious? Yeah. He didn't follow what everybody else thought. Um, so, yeah, Mr. Miller might have had an advisor who pointed him out. Right. right. So, yeah. I had a teacher who didn't think Plato was a Platonist and that he thought Socrates is living out the good life. And that was just a, a take for me, right? But his, my teacher wasn't publishing in fancy journals either. So those things happen. That's why when you read it, on the one hand, you understand the blindnesses of the people. But on the other hand, you ask, well, what are the blindnesses that I'm in the middle of and how can I escape them so I don't make this mistake <laughs> that these people made? Uh, does that make sense to the rest of you? It, you don't read it to justify your blindnesses. You read it to think about how many good intentions have ended up going south. <laughs> um, does that make sense to you, Warren? It makes sense can you hear me? Yeah, okay, now I can. I've been answering, but it seems like my microphone was off. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. what, what, one of the things that what I, what are the things that I was going to say is that is like what I really appreciate, even though some of the times we may still judge the persons, is that for this class it opens us to see how the people were back then and we study them to this date and we just have the understanding to say, oh, this was what was okay back then. And we don't say, oh, they are horrible individuals or we just outright judge them. We just have the tolerance to understand that that was just the norm back then and not to say, oh, they're stupid and they are evil people. Even though some of them were evil people like with the whole Nazi, Nazi stuff that we covered the other day, but like just how they thought about things back then and we're studying it now. I think we should just appreciate that. I appreciate that we can see them for who they are and not outright judge them. And I think it takes a different level of understanding to do that. The other thing is that you can identify the cynical people that punched their buttons because mm -hmm. that's the real source of the evil, right? Yes, they so, only do things to benefit themselves. And they have power and they have smarts, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And so that to me, evil is not the drug dealer in the street, right? No. Evil is the people behind the evil geniuses that organize things so they can get richer. And that involves punching the buttons of vulnerable people, right? getting them distracted like porn and getting them afraid and getting just getting them to be silly putty so that I can get more money. So that would be the guys in the cave staring at those shadows, figuring out how can I get these, these shadows all, you know, worshiping me, you know, yes. and yes. that's where the evil is. And it gets, I don't, I think most Americans don't see the evil where it really is coming from in this country. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I would uh, say that um, history, but, you know, all of that is, we have that so that we can, you know, see where it's coming from, but also so we can think, like, they used to think they were just dumber down back then, you know, and we're smarter now, but you also have to think the evil people have also became smarter. They saw... You see how uh, you saw what happened. You've learned. You've adapted. You've gotten better, and they've also learned, adapted, and gotten better at manipulating. And right. those stories show you that it's not just you know, drug. You know, you think it's the drug dealers in the streets, but you gotta think where did they get those drugs from? You know, <laughs> it's a bigger picture. And I feel like we get too distracted. Yeah, as you said, we get too distracted with the little trivial things like. In a hundred years, they may talk, they might come back to us and talk about how we were too distracted with 
our gender and sexuality and all that to realize what's actually going on in the world. And we're going to be like, well, we could have prevented that, but could we? We could prevent that by realizing what's going on instead of being distracted, if that makes sense. Of course, that's why 50 years ago, when I was 16, Martin Luther King got shot while I was celebrating my birthday. And I decided, I think I want to think, right? I think it's over. Um, and what I thought was 50 years from now, 100 years from now, if we don't change, we will destroy life on earth. And people will say, what were those people thinking? What were they thinking while they were destroying life on earth? And you all know the answer to that question. That is not what people are thinking about, but we are doing it, I guarantee. Everybody who knows, knows. And if you would get the news every day about what's going on, you would know. It wouldn't be a problem. But it's all this incredible brainwashing. Um, but anyway, so let me just go through these outlines. And then to, the next time we meet Wednesday, we really need to start with your reactions to this, because obviously, uh, you would have more reactions than I gave you a chance for. So yeah. this, this one is about the illiteracy that people don't read, that 30% of Americans are functionally illiterate. They can't read enough to function. 80% uh, of families didn't buy or read a book. Um, propaganda, um, elections, they vote on the basis of how a candidate makes them feel, one of us. And totalitarian systems are like that. That So I hope you can see how the pieces fit together because that article about American fascists has, you know, it is all this stuff, right? It's in a particular example. And then Mr. James never, you know, hey, hey Mr. James, <laughs> did you have any idea this was coming? And Karl Marx had no idea this was coming. Although he thought, well, he thought as long as you stick to capitalism, this will happen. Um, but he thought we'd get salvation. And of course, Russia is a good example of how that fell apart. So, you know, both things failed. Pure capitalism, pure communism, they both completely failed, but we keep sticking with it. Uh, the pornography industry, so that's the exploitation of sex, one of, one of our main drives, commodification of human beings, they're made into consumers, um, the cult of eternal childhood, um, that's what, this goes back to Freud also, um, is there some big daddy in the sky, you know, who's going to save us from all of this? Uh, porn stars are generally drug addicts and extremely unhappy people. Uh, there's racism in, in porn. But I don't know if I quoted, this guy says, well, it's a free country. We just sell a product. And, and, and it's hard to make porn illegal because it's a free market and people freely choose, you know, to become porn stars or whatever. Who are you, you know, to tell me, you know? this stuff um Dr. Beck, so, yeah back on that document I, I i perused a little through that document the thing that took me aback was the number one i i knew that the industry made they made a lot of money in it but i did not know that they made that much right you could like, even, even back in the day even back in the day and they were they were more they're worth more than all these companies back then. Yeah, I mean, I had a student that said she went on to a site where it wasn't that much. But I mean, let's say it's half that much. It's still like no, the but... industry. When they say the industry, they mean all the sites put together. Yeah. yeah so and... it's not it's not one specific site. So you're not going to go on one specific site and find um. Right. But, um, I mean, yeah, he, so. he is a journalist and he had a Pulitzer Prize. He has a reputation at stake if he's wrong. So he must have gotten yeah. his data from somewhere. But yes, he has that, to be of some credibility. Well, not only that, but if it was half that much, it would still be shocking, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. 
whatever it is, it's not what the average person thinks it is. Yeah. Um, and I what, I, what my other question, I, I, I would have to check to see if it's still worth more than those now. Because those check. companies, those companies back in 2006, what they have developed and become now, even Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, and Netflix, what they have become now, if it's still worth more, then I would be really shocked because so, those companies so have come look far at away. The, look at the 97 billion and just see what they're worth now, right? Yes. Yeah. And then you would know. I mean, the porn industry is more than 97 now, but probably it hasn't grown as much as those other ones, right? Because they've skyrocketed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good point. Um, so we have the corruption of the mind, literacy. We have a corruption of sex. We have his quote about Plato's cave. This is this is why I prefer teaching Plato to people who aren't going to try to get PhDs in philosophy, they're just going to use it to live their lives, right? And that's what Hedges does. And he does a good job of it. But if you if you ask a Plato scholar, they're just sitting in their offices. Um, okay, and then we had five lies. This was written in 2019. So you could, this is before COVID. So here is I don't know if you read this, but I read that one. And one of my biggest reactions is, okay, here's my thing. People know this. Like, okay, I know this. The person who wrote this knows this. So how many people know this, but it remains a problem? That's like, why are we consistently willing to just, stay slaves to these things yeah well, yeah. yeah even mr uh brooks he says you know that uh the new york times called him and said he made it on the list the bestseller list and it didn't mean that much to him but i'm telling you it meant a lot to him in his effort to get there and once you're there like i i've seen a lot of interviews with this guy and he he is pretty full of himself because he keeps getting reinforced by people exactly like him. And he doesn't, he has blind spots. Um, and then he, you know, so anyway, um, then there's this stuff about the illusion of happiness. And this is really important. Um, uh, I hope we need to go over this too, because it's about psychology. And I did not scan this chapter. Um, I mean, if you really want to read the whole chapter, I, there are books in the library, I think. But it's very important that the discipline of psychology, it teaches you how to mold people. And that's where John Stuart Mill thought, yeah, we'll have the social engineering and everybody will be, you know, generous and self-controlled and middle class and blah, blah. Well, the trouble is you give this tool to people and then you do it in the context of a society where success is money and power and pleasure. Well, that's what you've got, right? Um, this, they, and they sell out. They make a lot of money selling books about happiness, positive illusions. Think of this stuff. I, this is just outrageous to me, right? That people like lies and you should tell them lies because that motivates them, my God. And he's saying, well, it might motivate him for a little while, but not in the end. And then the way that psychology was used to teach um, this torture techniques, right? To teach these techniques that then got used for all sorts of nefarious purposes. And um, a Jewish, right, a Jewish psychologist, <laughs> Oh no, you know, we're not responsible for how this gets used. It's this, hey guy, wake up. Um, let's see. Anyway, I that really amazed me. And then there's some excerpts from the illusion of America. Cultures that can't distinguish between illusion and reality die, right? And that's that's what the cave is about. That's why I like liberal arts education is because it really 
is based on Plato watched his democracy die, and he's trying to create a whole system of education that would prevent that, right? Um, anyway, and um, Mr. Uh, Hedges brings in his Christian upbringing with the hope and love, right? So those are his, he's not anti-religion, but that's it, you know? And so he's not anti-religion per se, but he's definitely not in favor of this kind of pseudo-religion, right? And the first sentence of it says, unlimited tolerance will lead to the disappearance of tolerance so that's what william james did not account for so so you know this is kind of an answer to william james but it brings in the 20th century and freud you know daddy in the sky thing and marx opium the people and he does link together the fascism of the religious fascism in America with declining economic situation with this desire for somebody to save you. If you remember in the Freud article, Mr. Edmondson talked about that, that we have to live with a certain amount of ambiguity. And this is the Lion College mission statement, right? Um, we have to stop looking for the daddy in the sky or the strong man um, willing to take a stand. Um, and then in my world philosophies class, these things come up quite a bit because Socrates did it, Jesus did it, Buddha did it, Gandhi did it, and Mohammed did it when he was younger. Um, all right, so I'll have to let you go, but we will, We'll start next time with you guys talking more about this assignment. And then for next time, oh, what do I have? I have, um, oh, the psychology of war. So we've just been at war for 20 years. We have a lot of people with PTSD. Um, we have, how do we deal with that? And so we're going to start talking about um, the PTSD. There's a, a neuroscientist who is developing therapies for that. Um, also, girls who got sexually abused or raped, they have PTSD and he has to help them get over that. So we're moving into current therapies. Um, based on empirical data, but motivated by desire for human well-being, right? Not here's what happens when psychology is motivated, has the wrong motive, or it's ignorant. They have good intentions, but they're wrong. And then, then we'll start in with uh, therapies that are well motivated, have good values. Does that make everybody get that? Does that make sense? Um, yes, yes. So just try to link the fascist article with anything else that we've already studied. I think it all links together. No problem, Dr. Vick. Okay, thanks. No problem. I'll see you on Wednesday. Yep. Bye bye, guys. Bye. bye, -bye. You want to meet tomorrow? Yeah, okay. <laughs>